Well, good morning, everyone. Um, we are going to be getting started here in just a couple couple seconds. Um, just want to remind everyone to keep your mics muted until we get to a point where um, there will be some time for um, discussion. And I think Liz and Genesis would welcome um, getting to hear people's voices. You can also use the chat um, at any time. Um, it's never easy to do this on Zoom. We would love to be in a room doing this. So um, just realize that we're happy to have you guys turn your mics on and your cameras on once um, we get into that part of the, the conversation. But in between, if you can keep your mics muted, that would be awesome. Um, but it is 1130. My name is Tamara Benjamin. I work in Purdue Extension in the department, the, um, the area of agriculture and natural resources. And I coordinate a program called Diversified Farming and Food Systems. You may have heard us say DFFS. It's always a mouthful. Um, within DFFS, this, this project um, of the Indiana Small Farm Conference was actually the impetus for DFFS getting started. And from there, we have branched out into all kinds of areas, beginning farmers, ur urban agriculture, organic agriculture, local foods, and, um, but, you know, our, the, 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 I guess the gemstone in our crown, in my opinion, is the Indiana Small Farm Conference because it's the one place where we all can get together. Um, unfortunately, we've not been able to do it in person for the last two years. Uh, when we made the decision for this year, it was at the height of Omicron. So uh, a lot of people are questioning me now, like, what are we doing? Why are we doing this on Zoom right now? And I think, you know, at the time we wanted to make sure we had a quality conference for you guys and we needed time to pivot it. So, um, yes, uh, you know, a lot of people aren't wearing masks anymore and all of that. And had we known, been able to have a, you know, a crystal ball in front of us, we probably would have not pivoted. So I just appreciate you all being here and taking one more chance um, to be on Zoom together and looking forward to 2023 when we're all going to be um, together in person. So um, with that, I want to kick off our second keynote speakers for the, the 2022 Indiana Small Farm Conference. Um, we are really, really lucky this year to have two of the um, you know premier farmers that are small farm small scale farmers in our state, and um, just want to you know thank Genesis and and Liz for being here. But I also want to take the time to thank all of our sponsors. So we decided to do this conference for free for all of you guys. Um, it is your time, so you are spending some time. So that is that is a cost. But um, all of the speakers that are at the conference, they get reimbursed um, for their time. And we try really hard to reimburse them well, uh, whether they're a speaker, a panelist, or one of our keynote speakers. And the only way to do that, if we're not gonna charge you guys anything, is to get sponsors. So I wanna just really reach out to this group of sponsors. They um, came through and continued to give funding to all of us. And I think one of the things that's amazing to me is to see two Vermont companies every single year, they give money um, to, to the conference. So, you know, if, if you can reach out and, and send an email to any of these places and just say thank you again for providing this, this would be, be really great. Um, and every year we get, you know, unique people and unique groups to, to support us. So thank you to all of our sponsors. Um, before I get started, I'm gonna present Liz and Genesis. Um, I would like you all to do a survey. It's really fast. It's literally like six questions. Um, you can use your phone to take the QR code right now, or there is a, um, in the chat box is the link. It's super, super fast. I'm just going to give you a couple minutes, like one minute to get that done. Uh, the idea here is we just need to know who's all online. And um, we, we don't, we, we're not taking, taking notes about all of you guys, but we, we, um, get it all together so we figure out who we're reaching. And that's really important for Purdue University because it shows USDA and some of our other sponsors that we're meeting the needs of a diverse group of people. And we're not just focusing on uh, people that look like Liz and Genesis. They're not all women that are small scale. We've got all kinds of farmers and we really rejoice in that, that we, we meet the needs of everyone. And that's what we're trying really hard to do. So if you don't mind doing that quick survey, uh, getting it out of the way, you won't have to do an evaluation survey at the end of this uh, seminar, but in the next one, in the next session, that's when we'll do a little evaluation. Again, they're real fast. So 
So just whip it out and we'll be all done with that. Um, I think that's so I, with that, I'm gonna um, shut this down, stop sharing. I'm gonna pull up another one. Um, so just gonna give, have to give me a little bit of time to um, get this all figured out. Cause I, you know, every time when you wanna do something, you have to remember how was I supposed to do it? Um, so with that, I just wanna say that it's, um, I, I started working here uh, in extension about eight years ago. I guess it's about eight years, seven years ago. And um, some of the first people that I met when I started working were Genesis and Eli and their families. And um, I, I remember thinking, you know, this is the face of the future of, of farming. Um, young people that are willing to um, take over and start really working the, the land, doing things different. And then I started realizing it's not just people that look like Eli and Genesis and Liz and Nate Brownlee. It's, uh, it's a whole group of people. And um, I work with people from ages from 20 to 80. Um, I work with people of all colors, all shapes and sizes. Um, and I think one of the things that we really want to um, we want really want to just embrace within our state is that we're a unique bunch of people. Um, farmers are a unique group of people, and they're all um, in it for probably the same reason. Every single farmer I've met all over the world, they have a true belief that they want to help feed the world, um, however that looks. And so I, I think it's you know one thing that I, I want to just express um, with this conference is. Um, let's try to find ways that we're similar and how can we join together and be a united front um, when we're talking about producing food and fiber and fuel in the state. So with that, know that maybe wasn't the introduction you guys wanted, Hila, uh, Genesis and Liz, but um, I, I know you guys are going to talk more about your farms, but I'm really thankful that you two were some of the first two people that I met as farmers in the state and I'm really really feel blessed that I've gotten to see your journey and um, get to explore it today with you. So with that, Genesis, you're gonna take over and I'm gonna shut my camera down. Thanks, Tamara. I think that I get my request through to go. Okay, it looks like I did. Okay, hi, hi everyone. Um, I'll just start by acknowledging that it's always a little weird to present on Zoom. So I'll just put that out there that um, Liz and I are really looking forward to it, um, but it's it's new for me especially. So I feel a little bit of nerves, but uh, plan on settling in and hopefully hopefully delivering some, um, some information, some stories um, and some content that um, feels both informative and like something y'all can um, connect to. Um, so let's see. Let me see if I can get back to our title screen and Liz is gonna kick us off. There we go. Okay. Thanks for being queen of the slides, Genesis. Um, well, hey everybody, my name is Liz Brownlee and uh, I'm a farmer here in Southeast Indiana and I'm also the president of the Hoosier Young Farmers Coalition. Um, and uh, as of like four, well, maybe eight weeks ago, uh, the director of farmer programs for a brand new organization called Partners in Food and Farming. And I want to tell you about all of that. I'm really excited to be talking about all of that, but mostly what I want to share with you guys today and what Genesis and I have been preparing to share um, is how um, we're maturing as a group of farmers in the state um, and, and how it's a really exciting time to be coming together um, and taking some pretty big steps and then inviting you all to get involved. So we're gonna do, um, well, I won't get ahead of myself. Let's dive in. First, a, a big thank you to all of our partners statewide. Um, we have been really um, lucky to work with people, um, nonprofits, farmer organizations, food councils, NPR stations, everybody uh, who we've crossed paths with has said, oh, how can we help beginning farmers? Um, and so we wanted to take a second just to say thank you to those folks who um, have helped us these last five years as we've gotten started with the Hoosier Young Farmers Coalition. Um, and we also want to take just a second to say uh, we know not everybody was on that screen. Um, we want to um, just say out loud, we really want to seek partnerships with each and every one of you. 
Um, but before we can do that, we need to know who you are. So if you could um, just click on who you are, uh, what's your primary role in the food system? Since we can't all raise our hands in person and such. Thanks guys, we've got lots of people chiming in. We've got about almost a hundred people in the room, which is really exciting. So we'll give folks a second more so we can see. And so far, farmers are in the lead, head and shoulders. Really delighted to see educators and community advocates and government officials and employees in the room too, and, and eaters for that matter, um, but pumped to spend time with our farmer friends. That's what's beautiful about the Small Farm Conference in particular is that time together and can't wait to be in person next year with that. Um, awesome. Okay, well, I'm going to press end poll, and I think that will mean you guys can see the results. Um, can you all see that? Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe. Um, looks like about half of, of folks are farmers, and then we have a mix of others in the room. So that's really, um, that's really exciting. Um, I'm going to press stop sharing, and I think that will make it go away from your screens. Um, and Genesis, why don't you hit me with the next slide? Oh, maybe I have to click mine. Okay, I think I have to close my poll too. Nice. Ooh. You're all right. Beautiful. All right, one more. Okay, so you guys are playing today. Um, now that we know who you are, we want to um, share who we are um, and talk about um, how we've been working to connect um, a diversity of farmers in the state and then do a listening session. So we're gonna take at least 30 minutes of the hour and a half today to um, pose questions to the group and have people um, share their ideas because we really wanna be um, yeah, in tune with what people need. Uh, and then we'll have some Q and A at the end if, if people want it. Oh, sorry, I think my arrow button is not working. So I'll just use my mouse and then hopefully that'll, that'll fix it. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, so I'll hand it off to you, Genesis. Okay, yeah, so we're just gonna start with, um, I'll kind of run through a little bit of our history. We kind of were, were hoping and figuring that this audience would be um, heavy on the farmer side. And I know when I am in a presentation with farmers, I always want the nuts and bolts, I want the background. How'd you get, you know, how'd you get started? What are you doing? Like, you know, give me give me a roadmap from with which to work to understand where you're coming from. Um, so Liz and I are each gonna take about um, seven or eight minutes to kind of walk through the history of our farms. Um, and so I am first. Um, and these were really fun slides to put together um, because we are officially 10 years old. Um, I run, uh, own and operate Full Hand Farm with my husband, Eli. He's in the black hat there on the picture on the left. Um, that is not our son, but um, uh, that is our very first market that we ever did um, very early in 2012. And we started in 2012 after doing a two-year apprenticeship, 2010 and 2011, on a CSA farm in Iowa. Um, and then decided to come home to Indiana. We had access to one acre of family land where we, we were not living on site, um, but we were farming an acre of Eli's dad's land um, outside of Greenfield. Um, and, and we just dove right in with high tunnels and an acre and started going to market really early. So that's our very, our very first offerings at market, which is a, a, a fun picture um, now to see. Um, so 2013, again, this is still at our um, family land. Um, we added an acre, so we're doing two, two acres um, and kind of makeshift. So this is our original wash pack situation on the left-hand side, um, and one very wee acre up in the front um, that we that we started working with and started really kind of just digging in and um, a lot of trial and error in those first years, lots of trial and error. Um, we were selling at a year round or selling to market year round. Um, so at that time, we were doing the Zionsville Farmers Market on Saturday mornings. Um, and in our very first year, we did the 38th Street Market in Indianapolis on, I think it was Thursdays. Um, and then we did the Indy Winter Farmers Market through the winter as well. So we switched markets. Um, and I worked in restaurants um, as part of my, my off farm job that kind of helped capitalize the farm. So we started with very minimal restaurant sales um, in our first year as well, uh, with some of the connections that I had made in the Indianapolis restaurant scene. Oops, I have to use my mouse. Sorry, I will get on this. There we go. Oops, uh-oh, what did I do, Tamara? I bet you just click on the slide you wanna be on that number nine, it looks like is next. Thank you, Liz. Yeah, you're good. Yay. Nice. Okay, 
So also in 2013, we happened across, um, so we had land access that we weren't living on. Um, and so we were kind of just looking, trying to figure out um, how this was gonna go forward. How, how are we gonna find land? And this was like just one beautiful, crazy stroke of luck. We ended up um, coming across 25 acres of a lease to own situation um, kind of within our radius of where we were looking um, on Craigslist <laughs> of all places. Um, and the, the, the property was, was as is. Um, it had been in severe neglect for uh, maybe three to four years before we came to before we came to sign a lease for it and uh, we basically took took a pretty sore thumb off of the off of the owner's hands um, in exchange for being willing to put our elbow grease into cleaning it up so the house was unlivable as you can see on the left so that was um, that was kind of mission number one was to get the house into a livable condition and um, we moved in with a push mower on on 25 acres um, so 2013 was the year that we, we lived here where you can see, and we farmed um, at the, the slide, the previous slide, um, and we're kind of making plans to figure out how to, uh, how to move forward. Um, 2014, we really dived in. Um, we broke ground. This is when I showed Eli this picture, he said, oh yeah, that's me trying to learn how to use a plow. <laughs> uh, that's the only time we've ever used a plow. I don't think we've ever used one again since then. Um, and we also just really, really started to try and put some crops in to, um, to make, to really kind of make this a living. Um, so 2012, we both had off farm jobs. Uh, 2013, Eli was farming full time and I was still working my evening job at restaurants. Um, and, but 2014 was when we really decided that we needed to dive in because we had a child um, and I had to let go of my off farm job a few years earlier than we were thinking that we might. Um, so in 2014, our son was born in August um, and that was also the year that we hired full time. So that was, that was a really big year. Uh, we had one, she was part-time, but every day we had a child and we had no off-firm income. Um, in that time, we were really kind of trying to figure out like where to focus. There's so much to learn in those early years. And um, for us, because we had started at a year-round market from the beginning, um, that felt like a very low-hanging fruit. That felt like a demand that was not being met. And so really early on, we had focus on winter production. Um, so you can see some of the tunnels in the top left. Um, the, on, the, on the left-hand side are, are, well, actually all of those are movable. The left-hand side are uh, like 20 by, 20 by 50. We have four of those that move. And then we have three caterpillar tunnels, homemade. This is before Farmer's Friend um, that we still utilize and we still move around the farm. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about what we've added since then, but that was kind of our first suite of tunnels that we were using for year-round production. Um, and as you can see, we, we at this win these winter markets, we were just, you know, everything we could bring, we could sell. And so we really focused in those early years on, on upping the winter production, um, both to meet the demand um, and also to um, keep, keep employees, um, to keep people year round, to keep our, keep our own bills paid and really working towards trying to figure out how to keep other people on the farm year round so that, that we weren't having to hire new and, and train new every single year. Um, we were not keeping employees year round at this point, but it was sort of in our thought of like, okay, this is probably something that we're gonna need to do. Um, so into 2015 and 2016, um, 2015, we added a market. So at this time we were doing two markets on Saturday mornings, uh, loading two vehicles in the morning. Um, our son was um, not quite a year old. So Saturday mornings were um, like a 3.30 a.m. wake up, Eli would go out, load my market in one vehicle, load his market in another vehicle. I would get our son ready. We're out the door. I'm dropping my son off at my mom's house at 6 a.m. every Saturday. Um, thank you, mom. And um, meanwhile, back at the farm, uh, we're just doing tons of infrastructure, trying to, um, trying to really build the farm. So lots of water lines. Uh, we bought a water wheel transplanter at this point in the farm, um, just really trying to increase efficiencies um, and dumping as much sort of like profit as we could back into infrastructure, uh, back into infrastructure and sort of capital investments. 
Um, and a huge one for us is tunnels. <laughs> Always more tunnels. Um, I used to joke that they, they like procreate on the farm. We don't have animals, but we have tunnels and somehow there's like always more of them because you have, you have them and you get used to them and there's such amazing growing spaces. So, um, uh, so yeah, so this is some of some of our additions. So um, so this picture is one tunnel. And so two of our large tunnels have gone up over um, very late in the season, sort of under the gun uh, with a cold coming. And we're like, oh gosh, okay, we better finish this project. Got to get them up, um, including this this picture on the right. Um, so so these tunnels brought our, we, ha we have a total of 10 then now. So we've got three caterpillar tunnels, uh, four of the movable um, tunnels, those are from Atlas Greenhouse, and then um, three permanent 30 by 96s at this point. Um, and we have not added a tunnel for a while. So hope that, that could be that we're there. Could be that we're there. Genesis, I'm gonna um, jump in and give you a time check of seven minutes. So that's what I have completed. Yes, don't. Thank you. Don't hustle, but um, just so but you know. hustle. Uh, okay, so 2017, another big year for us. Our daughter was born, so two kids. We um, actually dropped a summer market, um, but picked up a winter market um, and rented some ground down the road after we had um, black rot in 2016 and had overspray um, herbicide drift in 2017. So we added some ground to be able to move around and deal with some of those um, challenges. Um, and then we kind of were in this like period of like steady growth between 2017 and 2019, um, where we were growing in acreage and we were growing in gross sales um, and we were growing slightly in hiring, but we should have grown more during that period. Um, and I'll talk about that uh, uh, a little bit more. Um, but that was, yeah, that was sort of a steady, a steady growth period. Uh, 2020, so this is another sort of big change, which, you know, for everybody, um, we added online sales in 2020. Thank you, COVID, for bringing us to the 21st century. Um, and also, you know, we, ha we had a whole year of nobody could pick their own vegetables. So we added this double-sided booth that you see where it was like walk-up sales. Um, and we had one very, very insane market year where we were um, packing every single person's order, every single person that came up. Um, and doing online sales at the same time. So we kept the online sales for about a year and a half um, until 2021. We dropped them in mid-2021 in July. Um, but we did keep our double-sided booth, as you can see. People can now come and, and pick their own. Um, and that's a great setup for us. We can move a lot of volume through those markets, but we have to have a lot of staff to be there. We need fully four people every morning or every Saturday at market to make that double-sided booth work. Um, but that's been great because... Um, our restaurant sales are now, they used to be 50-50, now uh, about 25% of our gross sales are restaurants, um, but the market markets have more than made up for that loss. Um, so this is kind of a snapshot of where we are in 2021. Um, we're currently doing about six acres of vegetables. I uh, have about um, six to eight employees in the height of the season. That's a mix of full-time and part-time people. Um, we do are still doing market year round. We do still do direct wholesale to restaurants, but like I said, it's it's about 25% of our gross sales instead of 50%. Um, and then we're also still uh, working the online store in a seasonal capacity. Um, and my last slide for is just 2022, kind of looking forward. Um, we've officially graduated from beginning farmer status, which the USDA classifies beginning farmers as someone in their first 10 years. Um, which seems crazy because that's such a long time. Um, it's like longer than it takes to get a PhD. Uh, but having come through that, uh, it's legit. Like that's for real. Uh, it takes, it's taken a long time and a lot of support along the way um, to, to kind of come through that period and feel like we're, we're like proficient. We can make some gut decisions confidently. Um, and so these are some of the, this is our, my crew from 2021 in the middle. Um, our best farming buddies, Nate and Emily from Silverthorn on the right-hand side, who have been really important to us. And then my HYFC board on the left-hand side, Liz, Nate, and um, Andrew Reardon there, um, have been some of the critical people to helping us kind of move through these 10 years. And moving forward, we're just really trying to work on fine-tuning our systems um, and really focusing on people, um, including ourselves. <laughs> um, and I so then I'll hand it over to Liz to kind of give her snapshot of how they got started. Yeah, thanks, Genesis. Um, that's beautiful. Um, okay, so I'm going to give you the version on our farm, how we got started and how um, sort of how we 
see maturity points. Um, so um, Nate and I um, are both from Indiana, but we spent five years up in Maine and Vermont um, working on farms to try to learn because when we decided we wanted to farm, we didn't see people in Indiana doing what we wanted. And then you guys were probably out there and we just didn't, we just didn't know. And we didn't know how to tap into the community. And in the Northeast, we saw a whole community of, of local food growers. And, and so we went up there and we worked on farms and apprenticed and then came home in um, end of 2013 and started super simply. Um, that first year we had, um, we took 13 acres of my family's farm out of corn and beans and planted a diverse cover crop mix. And we raised four pigs and 300 chickens and 45 turkeys and that was it. Um, and because we didn't know if anybody in Indiana would pay a premium price for a premium product. Um, we focus on rotational grazing and that has a lot of labor costs and we do all non-GMO feed and that's expensive and so our meat is expensive. Um, but I also think it's really good and what we found was that we sold out um, and we kept selling out. So um, Genesis, if you'll click the slide. Um, we um, we really um, planted the pasture in 2015. We had an equip contract, and if um, if any of you guys out there are, are livestock people and you don't know equip, by all means check it out. It's through the Natural Resources Conservation Service, and we basically got a, a cost share to convert that corn and soybean land into a perennial pasture. And it was super weedy at the start, but that's okay. Um, and we started seeing the positive, um, the positive impacts of taking that land out of, out of monoculture and putting it into a diverse system right from the start. Um, so dragonflies and spiders and um, lots of songbirds showing up early on. Um, and then uh, over time, frogs and softshell turtles and herons. And um, it's just been really beautiful to see um, how quickly the land can heal if you give it some space and rotational grazing fits really well with that. So keep going, Genesis. Um, we were selling most of our food through our meat CSA. Um, we did at laying hens in 2016, as well as interns, uh, not selling the interns, selling the, the eggs. Um, we, um, we just kept selling out of food. It was lovely. We sell into small markets. We sell into Madison, Indiana and Seymour, um, which are both small towns, 12 to 20,000 people. Um, and at the time we were also selling to Columbus, which is more like 45,000. Um, though we were always confused why we didn't sell more food there, um, but we kept at it. And the other thing from this year is we put 50 acres of tillable ground into the CRP program. That's another federal program um, that pays for converting annual crop ground into perennials, but in this case, um, it's a conservation plant. So we did native grassland and pollinator habitat. And that was a big maturity point for us because it let us take over stewardship of all the tillable acres on my family's farm. Genesis. Um, and, you know, the, the growth just kept happening for us, but it was still just the two of us. Um, so we were realizing we weren't, we, that the shiitake mushroom enterprise that we had started uh, was always at the bottom of the list. And it turns out that logs never complain, whereas pigs make it really clear when they need you to feed them. Um, and so the shiitakes were always the bottom of the list. So, so that was the first time we said no to something. Um, and that was a really big point for us. Um, we hated to do it. Um, because the mushrooms were selling well. We just couldn't get to everything. Um, we had started working with chefs. And so 20, oh, you're fine. So 2018 then was our biggest year of um, animal production. And we realized like, okay, this is the most that two humans can do, or at least these two humans. Um, we, so we dropped a market. Um, we dropped the Columbus market, um, not because it wasn't a good market for others, but boy, we were not selling food there. And um, we could sell so much more in smaller towns, even though Columbus is a wealthier community and a bigger community, 45,000 people. And so that was kind of a cool lesson for us too, that um, sometimes it's more about, um, for us anyway, where people really value our product and, and can't get it. And in a lot of small towns, you can't get an organic chicken, a pasture-raised uh, lamb chop. Um, we started breeding sheep in 2018. We'd just been raising um, like 15 or so feeder lambs each year. And um, we kept selling out of lambs. So we said, okay, let's let's invest in breeding. And that's been a real joy. We also added um, shrub willows uh, and elderberries, trying to do a, a silvopasture um, reality on our farm. And that's where we integrate woody crops into our pasture. Go for it. Um, so we felt like we were really cranking in 2019. It was, um, we were just over 50 families in our CSA. 
Um, we had we had really grown up with a couple of different restaurants, um, specifically Cummins, um, their internal um, restaurant in Columbus at their corp or their global headquarters, and um, that felt so secure, and our CSA felt so secure, and we planted 35 new acres of pasture, um, and the animals were really thriving. And then it was 2020. Um, and not only was it a terrible year for the world, um, I don't want to be flipping about that, but it was also a really terrible year on our farm. And it turns out you don't take pictures of terrible years on your farm. Like I, I went back to look for pictures for the slide and only found pretty pictures, which was actually a really cool retrospect kind of lesson, right? Like, okay, good things happened that year too. But you guys, like we had a well run dry, we had a pipeline of a well in a different field uh, burst. And so we had to Dig, out, dig that out and fix that pipeline. We installed solar to power one of our fields and then it failed and we had to convince the company to remove it and give us our money back and we had six sheep. And it was just like a big fire every three weeks and a big enough problem that, yeah, by the end of the year, we were saying like, what are we doing? <laughs> this is no fun. Um, but we had a commitment to our CSA members um, and our CSA members really saw us through COVID. You know, we had lost all of our restaurant sales. A hundred percent of restaurant sales were gone. And that was 40% of our business prior to COVID. Um, you know, a thousand chickens every year to Cummins. And, um, you know, uh, a couple other restaurants that, that had steady sales with us. And so we really had to ask like, are we gonna keep doing this? <laughs> but in 2021, um, we, we thankfully had a much smoother year. It was not perfect, but we decided it was the year of reclaiming our joy. Um, and, you know, had, had that terrible year happened in year two, I don't know if we could have sustained it, but because we had a community of farmers around us, um, we were mature enough to, to handle a pretty bad year. And so in 2021, we had our best farmer's market sales ever, even better than 2020. Um, we hosted two apprentices for the first time, so we had to build a cabin in which a house set apprentices. Um, and that felt like a big step because we had apprenticed on farms and we finally felt like we were ready to do that for someone else, to, to share our knowledge on a daily basis um, while they were living and working on our farm. Um, and we got our first persimmons from trees that we planted. We've planted probably a thousand trees on the farm so far, natives and cultivars. Um, and if you'll do one more slide, Genesis, we're hoping that this year is a year of balance. Um, so we were most of the way through lambing season. We got 28 lambs on the ground and four mamas to go. And we're really just trying to figure out how do we have a thriving business uh, and be thriving humans too. Um, and in fact, that brings us to our first little vignette that we want to share. So what we're going to do now is kind of transition into some bigger picture stuff, but we're going to use lessons learned from our farms to illustrate it because it's what we know best. Um, this is a picture from 2008. I feel like Nate and I look like babies. Um, we um, we'd just gotten engaged and we were we spent the summer up in Alaska um, working summer gigs and travel was just a really important part of both of our lives individually and together. It's really how we got to know each other. And um, and then for five years on our farm, we never traveled. We didn't go anywhere together. Um, we couldn't, uh, it just didn't, it just wasn't realistic. Um, and in year five, we took a trip and it was amazing. And then we just, it was so, it wasn't just rejuvenating. It was like an overhaul of what I even thought was possible as a farmer. And so, um, big maturity point for us has been figuring out how to build time away from the farm into our farm. Um, and, you know, this winter we took, um, we took two week long trips uh, this winter in our, you know, we got to know when's the easiest time to get away, but we also have to have people who uh, can take care of the farm for us and fill in our CSA pickups. And that means that our farmer community is maturing. And so it felt like a big, it feels like a big step to be able to prioritize, not just the farm, but also us, even if it's only, some of the year. <laughs> um, so we wanted to share that with you guys and then use that as a way to think about the Young Farmers Coalition. Um, so Genesis, one more. Um, because the aha moment for our group really came on uh, a trip, not a vacation exactly, but a trip. So I'll turn it back to you, Genesis. Thank you, Liz. I always love hearing about your, your upstarts. It's like every time, I mean, we've known each other for years, but every time we do something like this, there's like something new I learn about. Liz so thank you Liz um yeah so speaking of trips um we really we had kind of known each other but our really our real connection and the beginning of sort of what we're presenting to you all today 
um, started in 2016 um, when we, Liz and I were both on a trip. Um, actually, Tamara, who did the introduction to this course, um, had spearheaded a grant. Um, it, it was a big grant and there were a lot of pieces to it, but one big important part of it um, was to fund trips for farmers. I think there were two trips a year for three years um, to other parts of the country that had kind of more established local food systems. Um, and so the idea of the trip was to pair farmers with extension educators um, in their region to kind of go explore together um, areas that were sort of a, a little further along than Indiana in doing some things that, that we had been talking about wanting to do. Um, and, and it was wonderful. I mean, if, if I recall, the trip was in September, so it was a bit of a hard time to get away, but it was um, something that we just really wanted to prioritize. It was such an amazing learning opportunity. Um, and I, I, my first memory of like showing up at the airport <laughs> for that trip was like, oh my God, I don't have to make any decisions for a week. This is amazing. <laughs> you know, I just get to get, you know, shuttled around for a week. And um, it was, it was, it was an amazing opportunity. Um, and farmers were paired together or farmers were, um, we roomed together. So Liz and I were assigned roommates on the trip. And so that's, that's really how we, how we started to um, get to know each other um, was this like, I think it was maybe five days. It might've even been six traveling around um, Vermont and Maine uh, with a group of about 25 others. Um, Let's see. And so this trip provided this amazing um, kind of combination. We, we were doing a lot of on-farm learning. Um, we were on we were on a mix of farms, nonprofits. Uh, we were all over the place. Um, but we were really like boots on the ground, talking with these farmers, you know, for three or four hours uh, a morning and or a full afternoon, and really able to ask questions and kind of see see some situations that um, that that we don't have that. Where we could learn opportunities to learn some things to bring back to bring back to Indiana. Um, and there were there were definitely some hard skills that we picked up on this trip. So like one for me that we still utilize, uh, we had struggled with uh, long term storage of root crops on our farm up to this point. We were just storing them in like 18 gallon Rubbermaid bins. Um, and in January, we would pop the tops and be like, oh, we're really starting to lose these. You know, that I'm sure we're not storing them correctly. Well, it was on this trip um, where I was introduced to like this specific perforated plastic bag um, that uh, we, I noticed a farmer using. Um, and we still to this day use these perforated plastic bags for root storage and I can now store carrots for, I mean, almost a year if the humidity is right. Um, so lots of hard tips like that. And I know Liz, you wanted to jump in and offer one of the hard, hard sort of technical things that you picked up from this trip. The, for, for me, it was much, it was really about finances on this trip. I saw farmers who were figuring out what their profit centers were and then diving into them. So, so not to the point of a monoculture, right? But saying like within my diverse system, I'm not gonna do everything. I'm gonna do a number of things well. And here's how I figured that out. Um, and that was so useful early on in our farm. Um, and we're still learning from that. Um, the other thing I remembered is Richard Wiswall who has this great book about fearless farm finances that can help you think about your farm's you know, financial picture he had a volleyball court on his farm. And I just remember thinking like, how in the hell does this guy have time to play volleyball so often that he needs a permanent volleyball court? <laughs> <laughs> Clearly he did, right? Um, Cause they built it. And I thought it just really has stuck with me that we've got to figure out how to build in um, time for being people and joyful in addition to the joyful work we do with our farms. Uh, so then the other thing was just like time. So then we were like traveling, we were on and off this bus, we were in the hotel, we were like having dinner and we were talking a lot. If you can't tell Liz and I both like to talk. So we found ways of, we found lots of things to talk about. Um, but it was like a lot of dreaming and a lot of scheming and a lot of like getting to know each other and being like, oh, okay, we're all interested in these things and we're all in this place. So how can we bring some of these things back? Um, and this bus was actually the birthplace of the Hoosier Young Farmer Coalition. It was like on this bus that we were chatting. Um, and I think it was um, Roy Ballard, who is retired now, but at the time was the uh, manager of the North Central Sarah Grants and, you know, kind of overheard us talking and was like, hey, I think, you know, what you guys are talking about would be really applicable for a Sarah Grant. I think that you could probably go for a Sarah Grant and get something to fund, um, get something to fund that in Indiana. Um, Sarah Grants uh, help, um, help fund kind of innovative research project projects in specific locations. Um, and so, we really latched onto that um, and and went for it and started talking about what we wanted um, what we wanted to do, um, and that's really where the uh, where the Hoosier Young Farmer Coalition started. Um, 
and one of the things that we talked about is like we wanted a statewide organization from the beginning. Um, but haha, here speaking of you never take pictures in bad years. This was <laughs> I threw this in kind of funny. This is after twining tomatoes on a very hot day. Um, and just to sort of depict like Liz and I, we were both really busy launching our own businesses. And so the idea of starting a whole nonprofit from scratch was really intimidating. Um, this is a lot of what we were doing, <laughs> twining tomatoes and moving animals from pasture to pasture on, on hot days. Um, and so what we did with that SARE grant, though, is we kind of looked around and we're like, hey, is there something that we can plug into that already exists? And we were each individually already connected with the National Young Farmer Coalition. Um, and we're like, hey, there's not a chapter here. What if we just do that? It's within a certain, um, you know, it sort of gave us boundaries within which to work to just get something started um, a little more, a little more quickly. Um, and that that has been an amazing experience. So it's been about five years that we got that Sarah Grant to start um, to start the Hoosier Young Farmer Coalition, and we've done a lot. We're going to kind of outline more of what we've done, but they've been wonderful to work with, um, and and kind of made the bar to entry like very accessible for us trying to get something going in the state of Indiana. Yeah, for sure, because we had you know that time on the bus with growers, farmers who were doing all sorts of different types of farming, different scales um, from super small urban to quite large pasture-based operations, um, veggies of all different sorts, people with different enterprises and different socioeconomic backgrounds. Not a lot of racial diversity on that trip, but we're headed, stick with us, we're headed in that direction next. Um, but we realized the power of getting different sorts of farmers together um, from all over the state. And so we started, if you'll flip Genesis, um, with just really basic events. Um, to be a chapter of the National Farmers Coalition, you have to have at least three events a year. And we said, well, we can do that. Um, so we started with get togethers. Um, we'd have a, a pizza party, we'd have uh, and, and a farm tour. Um, and people showed up. It was really neat. You know, we, those early events convinced us that connecting and building camaraderie really mattered to farmers in the state. It wasn't just us that was aching for it. Um, and so um, we, we started being a little more intentional. Um, I think these are from a, a farm tour at Mad Farmers Collective in Indy. Um, trying to host um, casual events and, and farm tours that dug into the details a bit more. And we did two or three years of things like that. And, you know, we'd first we'd hope for 15 people and we'd get 30. And then we'd hope for 30 people and we'd get 50. Um, and we realized there was some, there was some momentum. So Genesis, you want to tell us uh, a maturity point? Yeah, so as far as like from HYFC, we were really like at that point, we we're like ready to level up. And so, and that's something that we've done on our farm as well. So this is sort of just bouncing back specifically to um, a pretty important moment at Full Hand Farm um, was when we bought this Sprinter van. So the van on the, the left, that purple beast, uh, is a 15 passenger um, van that was our market van for years. We just took all the seats out of the back and put some, um, some foam board insulation on the bottom and um, called it good. And we maxed that thing out for a few years, often having to take two, two markets or two vehicles to market at certain times of the year. Um, until in 2019, we purchased this refrigerated Sprinter, um, which was a big purchase, uh, especially because it was the very first thing that we ever bought that didn't give us an immediate return on investment. In a high tunnel, that thing is going to pay itself back you know, within six months, definitely within a year. Um, a bigger tractor with, you know, is it, gonna you're gonna be able to move more or work ground faster or work a different implement. But this was our first big purchase that was just like, you know what, we are just gonna buy this because we're gonna be able to load market on Friday afternoon, not at four in the morning on Saturday. Uh, we don't have to come directly home after market to get any um any leftovers back in the cooler. Um, it really bought us, it bought us time with our family, it bought us personal capacity. Um, and that was that was big. That was big. Um, so that's what we were looking at doing with um, HYFC. Um, yeah, as we well. were trying to um, exactly trying to figure out well how do we level up? And in 2018, there was a new farm bill um, in the works, um, and that is in case you don't know, the most important piece of legislation related to food and farming, and one of the most important pieces of legislation. Uh, in the country, I really think. And so we, um, our national chapter or our national organization said, hey, why don't you do a listening session with farmers and your your um, senators and your Congress people? And so this was an event we had um, here at our farm with HYFC um, where we had a farmer panel of people sharing their experiences and what their hurdles were and what was working in terms of federal policy. And that was this big growth point where we sort of said like, oh, 
yeah, we can we can do this. Um, we had a ton of support from from the national folks, but um, we again we were realizing the power of listening to more people um, with different sorts of operations and um, getting questions from the crowd. And we had a bunch of DePaul students at that event. I saw there's a question in the chat asking if we're if we're partnering with other young farmer programs, and um, you know the the answer is some, sort of, as much as we can. Um, so like we've been to table at the National FFA convention to try to um, connect with high school students. And we've um, had um, several times where we're specifically sharing jobs and opportunities for college students with campus farms, but there's a lot more work to be done there for sure. Um, Genesis, what's next for us? Oh, another growth um, So next is another sort of vignette, another example of um, how out on our farm, how we kind of matured, but this was a way that was sort of unintentional. And, and actually it's like in hindsight that I saw really how much this, this participation in this particular project helped us. So between 2015 and 2017, we were one of six farms that participated. It was called, it was called Be Simple, the Biochar Student Mentoring and Participatory, Participatory Learning Grant Program. Um, but and basically there was biochar that was um, applied on six different farms across the state and then it was studied for three years. Um, but a big part of that program was hiring an intern um, and then also meeting with the other farms. Um, and so for us, um, 2015, that was the first year we really had anybody full time on the farm. Um, and so we had we had student interns for three years. And what that did for us was really made us professionalize our hiring. So we had to um, interview. We had had to have regular hours, we had to have reviews with these interns. And so we were sort of in this low stakes environment, gaining these professional skills that we still now use um, as far as being employers. Um, the other really important thing about that program was that um, we were meeting, I think I remember twice a year with the six other farms participating and built some really strong relationships and ended up feeling very plugged in to what was happening in other parts of the state. There were two farms in the north, two in the central and two in the south. And it really made us feel like we were part of this group in Indiana. Um, and that was important for us, I think, even on those hard days to just be like, oh, well, I, you know, I know Jim's having the same thing down south or, you know, Corey and Liz said that they had that a couple years ago. And um, that was really important for us for sort of like developing this like underlying mindset of being like part of a community here. Um, but it was a very low, it was very low stakes. You know, somebody else was kind of building it for us. And we were sort of learning skills along the way without fully realizing how, how much of a foundation they were providing. Um, and, and similarly for HYFC, um, we had all this momentum, right? We were um, kind of had all these ideas. We were having all of these like um, meetings and potlucks that people were showing up to and we wanted to provide more formal support but we didn't have any money to do it. Like our SARE grant was pretty minimal. Um, that wasn't going to stretch it. And, and by a stroke of good fortune, we were able to connect in 2018 with a private donor who was who really believed in kind of what we were doing and wanted to help support farms in Indiana um, and said, hey, you know, let's do this. Let's build something. And, and you guys take the lead. Like, you know, farmers, you know what you know what can make an impact. And so we were able to spend two years building out our first um, formal program, which we called the fellowship. We launched it in 2020. Um, and it was a program that equipped beginning farmers with capital to scale their farms. So we worked over two years, 2020 and 2021, we ran the program um, and 12 different farms re received between five and $7,000 for, for a project on their farm. And also um, we were trying to really build community. And so there were um, monthly meetings and really trying to provide, you know, so capital infusion and also connection with people. Um, in that program is really when we first as an organization decided to really focus on trying to widen our circle, widen our, um, widen our impact and widen our relationships beyond farmers who are straight and white. Um, and so that farm reserved 50% of the um, fellowship or that program reserved 50% of the um, positions for um, BIPOC for BIPOC farmers. Um, that was a program that we did for two years and it's currently on hold um, while we kind of get some of these other things going, but we're taking into consideration some of the feedback that we got from those fellows on how to um, how to improve it. And we're looking forward to bringing that program back on a smaller scale in 2023 and hopefully on a bigger scale again in 2024. Yeah, um, we have, um, I'll jump in and say in case there's anybody on the call who is interested in seeing a program like that succeed. So we have um, hopefully some funds to do it um, with at least three farmers, um, maybe just in one county and focus on that farmer to farmer time being in person and on the farm. 
um, and um, and we're really interested in expanding that in the future. So if there are any partners out there who want to think about how that capital investment and scaling up of successful businesses um, for BIPOC farmers, for female farmers, um, for beginning farmers can be really powerful. We'd love to talk with you. And I'm going to try and buzz through this pretty quickly, Liz, because I think we might need to speed ourselves along. Um, but this is the last vignette from my farm as far as um, a signs of maturity. Uh, and this is one of my favorites. It just happened uh, about two weeks ago. Um, this is how we harvest greens on the farm. We harvest into these uh, mesh bags and then we tie them off and we we move them through water. You know, we wash them through water and then run them through a spinner. And we, I had a working interview uh, a few weeks ago and we were, I was working with some of my season crew and I had the working interview E there and we were working along and, you know, I was showing her, I was like, okay, so when your bag is full, you tie it like this and kind of, you know, went to move along. And was quiet for just a second and I had one of my one of my crew who's been with us for almost three years who kind of said uh oh, we don't tie the bags like that anymore <laughs> and I was like oh oh we don't she said no because since we got the bubbler when we tie it like that they fall apart so now we tie it like this because we run them through the bubbler and you know it's that shows how long it's been since I've been part of that regular operation and so now we've kind of got these other people who are who are here and who are uh, in our systems and are who are able to like make their own decisions um, and and kind of alter the way of things um, and so that I just wanted to share because I feel like it really highlights how important it is to like listen and make space for other people um, to kind of come into something that that you that you built and that you love but recognizing that it's that it's much better with with more voices in the room. So speaking of more voices, um, the other big project that we've tackled as HYFC um, is our storytelling project. And we partnered with folks all over the state, and Genesis, you can go one more, um, to try to um, actually go one more. I want to see the farmers. Oh, maybe it got dropped. OK, go back. Um, so we had pictures of all the farmers we'd interviewed. Darn. So we, we had a grant from Indiana Humanities um, that let us interview 17 farmers all around the state. Um, and we were really focused on listening to underheard voices. So um, in particular, um, we were trying to understand and, and learn from um, urban farmers, uh, first generation farmers, military veteran farmers, uh, BIPOC farmers, female farmers, um, anyone who doesn't fit that stereotype of a you know, 59 year old white guy in plaid driving his combine. Right? We wanted to hear from people who are growing food directly for their communities and a diversity of crops. And, um, and the goal was to update the narrative about, um, the goal was to update the narrative about like, what is food in Indiana? Who farms in Indiana? What's the future look like? Um, and so we took all those interviews and thanks to the grant from Indiana Humanities, we, had, we got to pay uh, um, folks to do the interviews and a podcast producer to turn it into um, really nice sounding episodes. He did such a good job. So I hope you guys will go to Hoosier Young Pharma Coalition's website and listen to these podcasts or you can read them also. Um, so you can click on that QR code or just go directly to the website there. And um, it, was, it was pretty neat to see what listening really teased out like common problems for farmers all over the state, unique problems, <laughs> depending on what they were trying to do and where they were. Um, and so we have episodes on everything from uh, finding farmland to food apartheid, to um, making your farm pay, to work-life balance. Um, and th that just for us, it really drove home the point that bringing diverse farmers together in terms of production and gender and race and scale and goals boy, that really makes the conversation so much more full and so much more powerful. Um, so go ahead, Genesis. Um, so, okay, so we'd run these two programs. I'm gonna do a little story from our farm um, to keep the train going here. On our farm, um, we didn't have any machinery um, and uh, neither Nate nor I is mechanically minded. So we were borrowing or renting or bartering tractors from neighbors for like three or four years and finally found um, a couple of old tractors. We bought an old tractor and Nate could like keep it running just barely. Um, and uh, that one could bush hog, but it didn't have a bucket on it. So we bought another beat up old tractor that did have a bucket, um, but it couldn't bush hog. And so each one was kind of a piece of junk. Uh, Nate says lovingly, they were projects. They were always projects. There's, you would go out to start them and something would be wrong. And all of a sudden he's taking apart the transmission. 
And so it was a big point of maturity for our farm where we said um, last year, okay, we know that our farm is making this much money every year. We need to buy a, pro a new tractor. We, ne we need to buy a tractor that can do all the jobs we need it to, that is the right tool for the job. And that was a maturity point for us too, that um, we, we knew what we needed um, and we could make the decision, an informed decision to, to invest in it. Um, and so um, similarly for HYFC, we're at a big maturity point. So da, 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 introducing um, partners in food and farming. Um, this is a brand new group that we are launching. We're seeking our 501c3 status. We're gonna be a statewide nonprofit that aims to bring together sustainable farmers, eaters and food system advocates all over the state uh, so that we can collaborate and, and do even more together. And to be super clear, the goal is not to replace anything that's happening. There's so much good work happening in Indiana, you guys. Um, you could fill magazines worth of the stories of goodness that's happening this month alone. Um, what we want to do is say, who's doing good work? How can, how can we support your good work? How can we cheer you on? How can we amplify what you're doing? And how can we connect you with others in the state who might be doing similar things so that we can team up and bring more grant dollars to Indiana or better serve farmers um, who might be in the gaps between the existing um, strength points in the state. Um, and so let's keep cruising. Um, we just wanna um, work together on this, but Genesis, uh, tell us about this airplane. Well, I was joking with Liz that it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be a PowerPoint presentation without at least one piece of clip art. Uh, so here's a clip art of a, of a plane, just to kind of highlight, like we're building this thing in the air. This is a phrase that we say around our farm all the time. It's like, we're building the plane as we're buying it. And it's, or as we're, as, as we're flying it, pardon me. We're building the plane as we're flying it. Um, and I was corrected in, uh, it should probably be a tractor, but here we still have a plane. Um, just to say, just to illustrate the point of like, this thing is, we're just, it's better to to start doing something and be making mistakes and learning and making adjustments and listening along the way than to never start at all. And so that's really the spirit with which we are, we are kind of launching into this new organization. So we want to give you just the quick and dirty on what we, we've got in the works, um, because we are still very much just figuring it out and we really want to listen. Um, we, um, we, want to say thank you to all of our partners on the um, Partners in Food project because we were able to um, work together with the Northwest Indiana Food Council and everyone else on the screen here to secure a million dollar grant for Indiana to push all sorts of different food system projects forward, um, including launching our group. Um, and we also have a, a private donor on board. And so it's making it possible to do a, a three-year launch. So I'm going to be working for this group. My colleague Jessica Murnane is as well. We're both part-time. Give me that first circle, Genesis. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we're going to be launching partners in food and farming. And in fact, we're going to be hiring a third um, person, full-time salaried position um, to help make this group fly. So uh, look for a job description soon and help share it because we want to um, have somebody with a ton of skills and, and insights and um, help us make this group happen. And then all the other partners on the group are going to be working on other, um, other efforts to make local and regional food systems um, stronger here in the state. And I'm not gonna read this because y'all can read, um, but um, I think this is really exciting. So you can click on the QR code there if you'd like to learn more about what's happening. Go ahead. Um, one of the big things that we're gonna do is host farmer programs based on farmer input. Um, so we did a survey last fall and we got 71 farmers to uh, respond. Um, and importantly, um, we felt like it was a positive sense of uh, a maturity point that it wasn't just um, folks uh, who reflected our board, which is currently um, growing and expanding, but still all white. So we had, we had um, you know, military veterans and we had BIPOC farmers, we had urban and rural farmers. Um, we had folks growing a wide diversity of crops at all sorts of different scales, ranging from an eighth of an acre to you know hundreds of thousands of dollars of sales a year. Um, and um, go for it, Genesis. And it really stood out to us that when we asked people, what sorts of programs do you want? Mentorship really rose to the top. So Genesis, talk to us about the power of mentorship. 
Um, so that is something that we're going to be rolling out. This is a picture of um, on the left, my husband Eli with our farming mentor Tim. This is on their farm, uh, I guess 12 years ago now, right after we completed a high tunnel build on their place. And then this is actually, they came and visited us uh, just this past December. So this is our COVID photo in our own high tunnel <laughs> um, from December. Very grainy. It's a cell phone picture. Um, but mentorship has been really important um, for us. And we know that it can be really important um, as sort of longevity of other farms as we get through it. So uh, one of our priorities for um, for moving forward with with PIF is going to be partnering with HYFC um, on a mentorship program um, that is going to pair um, farmers for a ten week um, a ten week farmer to farmer like established mentorship um, where the mentor and the mentee farmers will um, have uh, paid time to visit with each other. There'll be a travel reimburse, travel reimbursement to visit on each other's farms and some structured time to just kind of talk on the phone and a little bit of structured um, questions and things to work to work through. Um, so that's something that we're really excited about. We feel like there's been a lot of demonstrated um, success from programs like that and a lot of need for it here in our state. So we're excited to roll that out. Um, another thing that we've talked that we've heard from farmers um, in our surveys is just time to gather, just time to be together, to kind of shoot the breeze, to see what comes up, um, just kind of opportunities to, to be together. Um, and so that is something else that we're, is kind of a low hanging fruit for us that we're really wanting to focus on um, is setting up um, farm tours and um, field days. Um, and those will be happening hopefully throughout the state and with, with regularity. Um, and just, so we're, we're kind of looking at structuring these in two ways. Um, the uh, field days, we're hoping to really gear towards farmers as far as being more structured, um, kind of technical information. Um, and then farm tours sort of being more open to um, anybody who's, who's in the food system, um, educators, uh, eaters, um, anybody but so we're kind of looking at, at it, it's certainly we it well yeah we'll, we'll have kind of areas that that will focus on or sessions that'll focus on both and you know we want to take time to say that in the survey farmers shared that um building um equity through our food work was really important gender equity racial equity um is critical for us uh in indiana for any organization that wants to be useful and we know that our work needs to reflect the, the community of farmers in the state. Um, and so um, we're very aware that when we started HYFC, we were an all white straight group of people. And so uh, that's gotta change, right? And, and so um, the tangible ways we are making progress on that are building on the fellowship. Um, I think the representation on our farmer um, well, in our advisory panel, which we'll be launching, I hope you guys will look out for information about that. We want it. We have uh, the ability to pay ten farmers and food system advocates um, to basically give us advice um, for the next three years. Um, and so we'll be posting a bunch of uh, info about that to our um, both the HYFC and to the new organization partners in food and farming's e-newsletters and social media. We've got all that at the end of the slides. Um, and then seeking partnerships that benefit farmers um, of all scales and you know varieties of crops um, and um, the full suite of of the people who make up this farming community in Indiana in terms of of race and gender and goals and um, we're just really excited to to listen to folks out there about what they need and so whew, to that point we're gonna have a listening session now uh, so you guys can stop listening to us and we get to hear from you. Um, so basically what we're going to do, you guys, is put up a, a, a question on the screen and you can either um, type into the chat what you'd like to share in response, or if you'd like to share, um, there's a way to um, speak up. So on the bottom of your screens, just take a look. You hover over the bottom. It's uh, got a button that says reactions. It's like a smiley face with a plus sign. If you click that, um, there's an option to raise hand. And if you raise your hand, Genesis and I can see that and we'll call on you. Um, and then there's also a way if you click that smiley face with the button, the plus sign again, you can lower your hand once we've called on you. Um, so um, let's start with the first question. And it's all about um, maturity so for your farm we've talked a lot about our farms and our maturity points and hyfc and maturity points how will you know when your farm is mature um and i or how did you know when your farm was mature if you're further along so we're gonna just um pause for a second and let people 
chime in. Oh, I got a bunch coming in all at once. I was asked, do you guys want me or can you handle this part in the chat? I think I can. I think we'll do it. Thanks, Laura. You're welcome. Yeah, and I, sh I should say that I don't, we'll, we'll not read all of these, but just kind of, but kind of some of them to kind of keep everybody kind of in the conversation. Um, so yeah, and that was the first one that pops up that said when I'm not integral to every process happening and I'm able to step away and trust my team. I think we hear that a lot. We heard Liz say that as far as being able to go on vacation. And I know we experienced that on our farm. Absolutely. Um, Mike, Coop and Gardner, when we became profitable, that's stuff. Absolutely. Um, Courtney chiming in, I'm not a farmer, I'm a home grower. So it will be when I can produce and store the majority of our food. Absolutely. Yeah. Maturity in a sense of not, not necessarily sort of like what your goals are, maybe even more than your farm, just whether you're a farm or a homestead. Um, when I can have my only income be farming. Yes, absolutely. I know that's, that's, that, that's important. Katie from Tito Organic about uh, offering health insurance. Absolutely. Yeah, so lots of different ways, I think, and lots of different signifiers to say, to kind of think about, think about maturity and think about when, you know, where, where are you? When have you kind of moved beyond the, the, the beginning, the beginning uh, grind? Well, and just to say that the reason we're doing the listening session, <laughs> I don't know if we actually said that, is we want to know, um, how to shape our programs for farmers, right? What are you guys, what are you worried about? What are you hoping for? What are you aiming for? Um, and so that's that's shaped our questions today um, so that we can know um, what to provide. Um, so Genesis, I think you've got the next question. Okay, so yeah, here is a question. What could a group like PIF, so that's Partners in Food and Farming, do or have done to make your success smoother, faster, and better? Um, so maybe it's something we've already men mentioned. Oh, it would be great to have a mentorship program. Um, these are sort of, uh, again, answer however you like, but we're really trying to tease out sort of programmatic things as we're thinking how to, how to spend our time and our money, um, to serve farmers in Indiana, um, most effectively. Um, so sort of thinking about holes and holes or eh, opportunities for support that, that, that you would like to, or would have liked to access. Or just have more of, you know, I know that Purdue puts on incredible field days. Um, we want to do more of those. And so we want to team up on field days with them. And we have, we want, we'll have some on our own or with other partners like soil and water. Um, so things that things that are useful and that you just want to see more of count too. Um, we got a hand up here. Let's give Katie the floor. Um, Katie, I think you can unmute yourself and turn your video on if you'd like. Okay, can you hear me and see me or? Yeah. Okay, great. Hi, um, so in terms of, I guess, things that I think about moving forward um, to help make my farm more successful is, I've noticed this for a lot of nut farmers, especially um, in Indiana, is a place to process. Um, so right now there seems to be a little bit of a monopoly, um, especially on black walnuts, especially, in terms of where you can get them processed, how you can get them processed, uh, you really have to go through Hammonds, um, and they actually have kind of a, a hold on that machinery too. So you can't really even buy anything um, to help yourself out. If you're a small farmer who just wants to sell locally, you kind of are at the, the beck and call of, of Hammonds right now. Um, along with that, persimmons and pawpaws are a huge part of our crop. Um, the majority is persimmons, um, and also processing those uh, has been a, a hard thing to do too. Um, especially when a lot of breweries and places like that want them to be aseptic. Um, so not only finding a place that can process them and the machinery that can process them efficiently, but also making it so uh, it's a viable product for others to use um, in the capacity or the quantity that breweries want them in. Um, so I know there's some places in Ohio uh, that have some machinery that I can go look at and see, but 
I haven't come across anything in Indiana um, except for for one farm and he seems a little tight-lipped about uh, about his machinery and not letting me come down and see it anymore <laughs> once he figured out what I was trying to do so um, I guess there's a little bit more competition uh, here than I've experienced I guess in other parts of the Midwest so Interesting. Uh, really just a processing facility okay. for farmers in general would be amazing I don't know if like the, uh, the state could help out with that or um, just for any of those small farmers who just need a commercial space that's big enough and well stocked. Yeah, neat. Katie, thank you for sharing that because I know that um, like the whole nut producers world is one that we haven't connected with yet as HYFC because um, we were just all volunteer before. And, and so we're growing persimmons on my place. Of course, I'm thinking about that. Good to know that other farmers are thinking about that. And, um, you know, at the very least, we hope that partners in food and farming can be a connector. We can say, like, oh, I know Katie cares about that. And I know that there's a demand for this product from the breweries. Like, who who at Purdue might think be thinking about that? Who, what other farmers are dealing with that? Um, right, right. So awesome. Thank you. Yeah, and there you. is a link in the chat um, from Jody Smith about nuts, saying for nuts, oh, please perfect. see the value chain being developed. And there's a link, she, she listed a link in the chat there. Um, yeah, yeah. So I know yes. IU has been doing some work on a value chain. I think Purdue has too. And then Indiana Nut Growers Association might be a good partner if you guys haven't already thought of that. For um, sure. I think I'm probably, I might be the youngest member in that entire organization. So it'd be <laughs> nice to have some more young farmers who are interested in nut farming uh, join sure. that. Um, I'll be hosting probably most likely, I haven't talked to the organization yet again, but last year and the year before that, we've hosted the grafting meeting on our farm in May. Um, so I assume we'd be doing that again this year. Um, so Liz or uh, Genesis, I can get in touch with both of you and let you know when and if that's happening again this year. Um, that would be great. Thank yeah, you. just to, to see a nut farm that's, we have seedlings right now for pecans. We have some more mature trees and then it just, it's a bunch of uh, nut farmers getting around or getting together and talking about nuts. So it's pretty interesting. Fun. Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, well, uh, count on us to follow up about that because that's the kind of place where we need to be to go to farmers who are doing um, doing things and, and learn how we can be useful and share resources and ideas. Um, so All right. Thanks. Awesome. Yep. I'll be in touch. Cool. I just want Very to good. thank you, Katie. That's wonderful. A um, couple other things from the chat. There's one about a buying club um, to, you know, kind of getting together to buy supplies um, mm -hmm. that I think is a great suggestion as far as something that PIP could be organizing. Um, reliable information and education. Um, absolutely. Uh, oh, a forum. I think that's a wonderful suggestion, sort of providing maybe a forum or an email list or something like that, just to kind of facilitate peer-to-peer, farmer-to-farmer -peer, um, -farmer conversation. Mm -hmm. um, that's something I've always wanted I see Rebecca C wrote that in I've always wanted like a brain trust where you could say like okay guys here's my mm -hmm. idea do you think it would work where are the holes what do I need to think through um is anybody so, dealing with the same thing yeah mm -hmm. um, let me just see oh go ahead Liz no I was just gonna say um I let's keep um let's keep cruising with the next or do we have more? I didn't, I didn't um, see. That was, that was most of them. Yeah. And we are, guys, we are capturing the chat. All of this is, all of this is captured. I mean, that's part of the beauty of, of being in this format is this is being recorded and the chat, we'll get a, a transcript of the chat to be able. So even if I don't say it out loud, this is all mm -hmm. information that, that we're capturing and uh, we're going to be running back through as far as what to follow up on. Well, and to that point, I see the one um, about um, offering, um, you know, free or low cost programming. Um, our, we don't know how this is going to work, but our goal is that our programs, um, all entry level programs would be free, that we'll find um, basically corporate sponsors who see the need for beginning farmers to prosper, for sustainable farmers, for the future of, you know, the planet, um, and that we can um, find a way for this not to be a, a situation where farmers are paying to play to get access to our programming, if at all possible. Um, because yeah, because we've got to have we want we want everyone to have access to to that time together with farmers and to good information. Um, the let's see, are there any others we ought to specifically point out here? I see lots of things on like the business side, farm viability and taxes and bookkeeping and so um, heard. Um, <laughs> um, okay, so um, if you're just starting your farm, this is sort of building to our mentorship program launch. Um, if you're just starting your farm. What would you love to ask an established farmer? What's that like burning question? If you could have an hour with some really fantastic farmer in your 30, you know, who's just killing it. What would you ask? 
where to source materials. So that's the second time that's coming up. I know that was tough for us when we moved into town or when we moved back to the state was figuring out where to source materials. Uh, Amish, by, by the way, just to answer where we source a lot of ours, Amish Seed House, <laughs> which it can be hard because they don't have an internet presence. So sometimes it can be hard to pull it out, pull it, pull, pull it out of, you know, for those of us that are um, sort of digitally uh, fluent to move beyond that is can be tough. And I'll just throw out there on the, although I'm not in year 30 and killing it, uh, the, on the rotational grazing front, uh, we get a lot of our stuff from Premier One um, with their, their fences. Um, so we see uh, suggestions for uh, working out first land arrangement um, if you're not in the market to purchase land now. Um, and finding seed funding. Um, <laughs> Oh, and this is a good one, not being discouraged by farmers who, by non-farmers thinking what you're doing is not feasible. I'll say, you guys, my family and, and Nate's too, they love us and they were so worried for us. You know, they, they thought we were crazy to move home back to the farm. My parents had worked so hard to tell us to get an education and get off the farm, which, which we did. But when you love the land, you love the land. When you love feeding people, it's just, it's in your, it's in my heart. Um, and so then when those people, uh, whether you know them or not, say like, you're crazy, this will never work, um, whether out of concern, like with my family or just people who don't know about food and the power of food, that can be really discouraging. But I think that's what the farmer to farmer time can be so good for um, other people who get it. Yeah, um, so a few of these others, um, I, I wanna hear all about other mistakes farmers have made. Um, fertilization scheduling and amendment mixed usage. So like some of that really technical, like really focused stuff. Um, how to actually make money. We've heard that on our survey that popped up quite a bit. Marketing um, is something that we definitely have in our sites as being a high priority on, on, on addressing on a number of different levels is how to market. I think actually that looks like there, there is a session on marketing for in the small farms conference later yes, in the month and that I'm looking we're forward the, to. We're the sponsor for that one. So okay. take time to go to that one, you guys. Okay. Um, okay, neat. What's the next question, Genesis? The next question is, sorry, let me close my chat so I can see. Ah, field days. Uh, yes. Working with partners to host field days. And so these would be more of the technical nitty gritty production end of things. Um, so um, what, what, what are those production focus questions that people are working on right now. Weed control. Yep, I see that one pop up. Absolutely. I know one for me would be parasite control with sheep. I'm gonna, I'm gonna type that one in. Soil amendments and fertilization, uh huh. Cool season extension uh, during increasingly hot weather. That's a great suggestion. Yeah, I mean that's kind of in there with climate change, just sort of managing how to make the most use of your space. So like maybe companion planting. I think that um, Jesse Frost is doing a is going to be talking about that. Uh, is it tomorrow, Monday, sometime? I, I I can't remember exactly what it is, but again, another one of the small farms. Um, it's another one of the sessions dealing with that. Um, mixing annual and perennial cover crops. That's great. I know that um, at least on vegetable farms like no-till or low-till is a very high topic of conversation right now in a lot of different circles. And so we've talked about, um, you know, sort of just the, the nuts and bolts, the mechanics of how to flip a bed, you know, how, how, do you, how do you flip a bed if you're trying to use minimal or no-tillage? And I'm hoping to have that one come together. That field day, we're talking with Purdue Extension and Soil and Water right now about how to make that particular field day work. So when farmers say, hey, we need info on this, we can respond to it and, and try mm -hmm. to pull it off. Um, so um, Genesis, I think we're running out of time. Would oh, you okay, sorry, let's move <laughs> along then. <laughs> um, are, oh, there other, are there other farmer to farmer learning opportunities that you guys have seen maybe working in other communities, um, other parts of the state, other states that you would love to see happen in Indiana? You know, if we had all the money and all the time, um, are there things that you'd love to see happening here? Mm -hmm. 
So Dan Garcia is saying, look at the Intervale out in Vermont for their programs. That was actually one of the places that the Purdue Beginning Farmer Rancher Development Grant took us to on our trip to look at how they're doing um, really neat, a neat incubator program and also like a coaching program where if, if you're in like years, say two, three, four of your farm, like you've gotten, you've gotten going, but you need some help to really make it fly. Um, is this like one-on-one -on -one long term relationship with somebody who can help you say like, what's working? What's not? Where are you making money? What do you need to, to um, think about in terms of your soil health? The whole spectrum. Um, and, the, and some ergonomics for flipping beds and working on the farm. <laughs> I'm not as young a farmer. <laughs> um, I, would, I would love to see it small farms next year. Let's get some yoga for farmers with some like ergonomics, you know, um, built in there. Okay, and we'll definitely look at what Practical Farmers of Iowa is up to. Well, thanks you guys. Um, I think the next question is for our friends in um, Extension and in our CS and Soil and Water and anybody else who's that quote unquote ag professional, right? Serving farmers. Um, we'd love for PIF to be a, a, a useful partner to each and every one of you. Um, so we're curious to ask you guys, um, how can we help um, you serve farmers in your community. So Ashley Adair says, connect mm. us with farmers willing to do on-farm research. Absolutely. Um, HYFC just uh, started doing that, not necessarily intentionally, but we had a, a researcher from Purdue who said, hey, I want to do on-farm trials of annual strawberry production, and I need farmers, and we, we put out a call, and I think she was inundated with farmers who said, like, yes, I'm interested, I want to I want to partner on research, I want to have more strawberries, um, so that's pretty cool. What else do we have? Robert saying, let others know about our field days, for sure. Let us know what farmers need so we can train our ag professionals to meet those needs. Um, great, great ideas here, you guys. Thank you. Find um, growers for on-site field days, says Urban Soil Health. Resources and educational opportunities for low-income families. Um, and that, yeah, that could be on, on the scale of, you know, home gardening and such, um, for sure. Neat. Awesome. You guys, this input is so, so helpful. Um, okay, well, keep it coming. Um, but I think we're going to wrap it up because we got to, um, we got to send you all off to your next sessions too. So we've got about nine minutes left. Um, Genesis, I think we had like two more slides. Would you share oh, your screen? Did we? Uh-oh. I'm not right. quite sure what I did. Sorry. Ooh. No worries. No, oh, you didn't do anything. I am going to, I was going to move it over to the next thing. Can we, okay. can we move it over to my screen? Of course. Can I, I say one last thing, Tamara, and ask. then I'll, I'll be quiet. Do you guys need me to give it back? Otherwise I was going to pull up our other ones. Yeah, if you could just one last slide, if you if that's not obnoxious. Give me one second. Yep. Let Thank me, you. Share it one more time. Love it. Um, if you'll um click forward, whoever has the power. I, I'll click it. There you go. <laughs> and again, I think it's our last slide. Oh, two couple really quick. Um, you guys, uh, our National Young Farmers Coalition is doing a survey in preparation for the farm bill. Please, please, please take this so they hear from Indiana farmers. Um, next up. Um, I hope you guys will consider joining in the local food purchasing assistance regional listening sessions that are happening. I know that some of these conflict with small farm conference. So by all means, come and learn with the small farm conference. But if um, that session doesn't pertain to you and you can speak up about how this big $6.9 million grant that's going to come to Indiana can really serve um, BIPOC farmers, female farmers, um, and underserved farmers of all sorts, we'd love to hear from you or just email your input. Um, and I'll, I'll get you the info and I'll get your input to the powers that be at the State Department of Health. And last but not least, um, I hope you guys will get in touch. Um, the follow us on social media or the next slide is just that um, we, um, we have a very basic website set up and you can sign up for our e-newsletter so you can hear what's next and hear how we're partnering with groups around the state and how you can get involved. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Super, I am going to close this one and I'm gonna be pulling up one more, our final 
No speaker. Sorry. Always doing too many things at once. Thank you so much, Liz and Genesis. Really appreciate all of your time and um, and knowledge and willingness to share with this group of people. Um, you know, it's always a, a nice feeling to have to be able to um, have had you go go to I think every single small farm conference and now you guys are the keynote speakers yeah I was gonna say I'm pretty sure Genesis you're one of the 10 years I mean, every single one <laughs> I was gonna say there there are a few of you out there it's really cool when we have you stand up in the actual in person so hopefully next year um also just want to uh, again thank Indiana Farm Bureau they gave us quite a bit of money um to put on this and that's who we get to um share it with the two keynote speakers so you know, if any of you are Indiana Farm Bureau members, thank you. Uh, some of your dues came back um, to our keynote speakers. And then I just want to thank the Hoosier Young Farmer Coalition in general. We're really, really thankful that you guys started. I know that when we were out in Maine and Vermont, you guys kept pestering me. Why don't we have a Mafka? Why don't we have a NOFO? What do we, whatever they all are. And, you know, I was just I like, you were like, why don't, don't you guys know. start it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I did. I was, I think we were in the airport, you know, flying back and I was going, oh my gosh, these two are going to challenge me for the next few years of my life. So, um, you know, here it is. I know it's not an AFCA, but it's a, it, it has its own acronym and we're really happy uh, about you guys starting. And then thankful, thank, really thankful to all the conference committee. Um, it, this is not just me, Laura Engwell and her group did an amazing job pulling all of the content together. So thankful to all of the conference committee for all that they do um, to get this thing off the ground. And then you all as participants, thank you so much for taking time out of your day. You know, this is your lunch hour. I know for many of you, um, really appreciative that you were willing to log in and, and be a part of this conference once again. So um, hopefully we'll all see you next year in person. And um, with that, I want to just pass a couple of things. We do have an online scavenger hunt. We'd love for you guys to participate, download the um, app and, and sign in and post your photos. There's some really good ones, really fun ones to look at. Save your date, 2023, March 3, 3rd through the 5th in Hedricks County, if all goes well. So we're looking forward to it. And with that, I just want to sign off. Um, we are going to, and I think it's in the chat. I just can't pull up. I haven't pulled up the chat yet. It's in there the is chat. the link to the next one. It's starting at 1.15. So get up, go grab something to eat, go to the bathroom, shake yourselves out, do a little yoga like Liz was saying, go hug some lambs, uh, go tap some maple trees. I don't know what all you're doing right now, but uh, lots of good stuff going on in the state. And we look forward to seeing you in a, just a few minutes. If people have some other questions or thoughts for Liz and Genesis, they're going to be on here for another five minutes. But other than that, um, it's time to wrap this one up. <laughs>